Remember PewDiePie? I do. I think he's kind of fascinating. I didn't grow up watching him, but I know people who did, and to them, he was once this titan of online gaming with a huge, diverse platform, including kids who often posted memes like this. How far we have fallen. And then as time went on, he became more and more of a red pill cult figurehead. He kept doing mean, offensive things like yelling racial slurs while gaming, or having poor Indian people hold up signs with Nazi messages. And even though he was never explicit about having far-right politics, and in fact, often said the contrary, including supporting Black Lives Matter and sometimes condemning his own fans, said fans eventually transformed into a base of folks that apparently are mostly dudes who like edgy humor, I think. That's what I hear. Because of that, I'm kind of fascinated by PewDiePie, but I'm even more fascinated by his apparent favorite author. See, Yukio Mishima was one of the most important stylists in the history of Japanese literature, especially in the 20th century, and he also was a super weird guy. So weird, in fact, that I'm going to tell you about him for the next hour, and you're gonna be like, wow, wow, this guy's really weird over and over again. But he wasn't weird just in the sense of not fitting in, and he also wasn't weird just in the sense of being ultra-right, the way that liberals call ultra-right people now and they seem to get offended by. No, Mishima was his own special kind of weird. He's weird in a way that can only be produced once, and only in the context of the complex relationship between Japanese culture and the influence of the West, in the landscape of its empire's utter failure and collapse. So friends, it is time that we dive down the rabbit hole of one of the 20th century's most enigmatic figures, the famous or infamous Yukio Mishima. A renowned author, a lifestyle influencer, a guy who was really into other guys and also death, and worshipper of Japanese empire, hypermasculinity, and ultra-nationalism with such devoutness that it ended his life in one of the most bizarre ways imaginable. Fun. Before we do that though, um, let's talk about Aura, our sponsor for today's video. I have gotten a lot of bad, annoying spam messages over the course of my life and especially recently, and Aura is here to help me out. One of the reasons these spam texts and calls happen is because big companies can't keep our data safe. For instance, recently Ticketmaster was hacked and data of over 500 million users were put up for sale on the dark web. And that includes people's full names, their addresses, their phone numbers, their credit card data. This is the type of stuff that leads to spam, that leads to fraud, that leads to weird people having your not weird things. Aura, today's sponsor, is what alerts me when my data has been part of a data breach or leaked on the dark web. It can give me fraud alerts very quickly if anyone uses that data to access my accounts. And it removes my information from data broker websites, which are really creepy. And in addition to that being a creepy thing that ends, I also get less spam messages. I can also get things like transaction monitoring. I can get a VPN, that's always fun. An antivirus, a password manager, parental controls, and identity theft insurance. All in one app and at a good price, I think. If you're also interested in protecting yourself against these nasty weird people who take your data and send you spam, then try Aura. Go to Aura.com slash Elliot Sang and try your first two weeks for free. There's also a link in the description. Thanks so much to Aura for sponsoring the video. Now let's talk about that Mishima guy. Kazuya Mishima. <gasps> Friends, I have a surprise. To make this story of Yukio Mishima, which is often very dark and unsettling, a little bit more fun, I have brought on Noah Sampson and Foreign Man in a Foreign Land as audience surrogates. Oh no, I spilled tea on myself. Just like I'm going to spill tea with them. My one exposure to him is a, the video clip I mentioned. It was like a viral YouTube clip of him talking about how he found his wife or why yeah. he likes his wife. The second delay. Of course, I got, I got to marry her because I was attracted by her. And needless to say, I ain't gonna lie, I don't know this nigga at all. Like, until like, you texted me, and I searched him up, and then like, I saw PewDiePie, and I was like, oh, so that's not good. But I mean, like... <laughs> I'll include clips of them learning about the things I'm talking about as you learn about them in the video. Right? Right? Yukio Mishima was born Kimitake Haraoka on January 14th, 1925, two years after the Great Kanto Earthquake. He takes on Yukio Mishima as a pen name at 16, for reasons we'll get into. But the earthquake, I think, is symbolic and interesting because this helps you get context for how Japan was at the time. As Andrew Gordon writes in A Modern History of Japan, 
Estimates of the dead and missing ranged from 100,000 to 200,000. Tremors or fire destroyed 570,000 dwellings, roughly three-fourths of all those in the city. For a time, economic activity in Japan's largest city came to a virtual standstill. This was not helped by a domestic banking crisis that took place in 1927. The relationship between the new Japan post-Meiji restoration and capitalism is a fascinating one that I wish I could get into in this video, but it's long enough. There was also a global economic depression that occurred shortly after these events in Japan. You might know about it. The 2004 book The Madness and Perversion of Yukio Mishima by New School professor Jerry Piven has its strengths and weaknesses, let's say. For instance, it's pretty dated in the language and ideas about gender and ableism and sanism, but it is useful in some respects, particularly when talking about the trauma that Yukio Mishima dealt with in his youth. What trauma? I'll tell you what trauma. It started with his turbulent relationship with his grandmother. Citing John Nathan's biography of Mishima, Piven writes of grandmother Natsu, jealously, fiercely, hysterically guarding him against his parents and the outside world, and demonstrating insane possessiveness of young Mishima, demanding and receiving absolute control of her grandson's life. She was pathologically jealous, and if ever the boy resisted her, she interpreted this as preference for his mother and retaliated against Shizue that's his mother's name, vengefully. Natsu would fly into a rage if ever Mishima relied on his mother for anything, as young children do. His mother needed permission to take him outside, and this was granted only when the weather was acceptable, only on sunny and windless days. It is here that we see the potential origins of Mishima's complicated relationship with both femininity and disease. Piven writes that in one of his early writings, Mishima recounts getting medicine for his grandmother when he distinctly saw a disease in a bottle. He was dwarfishly small and was sleeping with his chin resting on his knees as if oblivious to the sea of medicine washing his body. Piven writes, one wonders if the disease in the bottle is his own reflection and self-conception. Such exposure to disease left an indelible impression on Mishima. He himself was a sickly child to the point of being near death several times, vomiting and falling into states of coma. In Mishima's acclaimed autobiographical work, Confessions of a Mask, he describes one particularly harrowing instance. On the New Year's morning just prior to my fourth birthday, I vomited something the color of coffee. The family doctor was called. After examining me, he said he was not sure I would recover. I was given injections of camphor and glucose until I was like a pincushion. The pulses of both my wrist and upper arm became imperceptible. Two hours passed. They stood looking down at my corpse. A shroud was made ready, my favorite toys collected, and all the relatives gathered. Almost another hour passed, and then suddenly urine appeared. My brother's mother, who was a doctor, said, He's alive! He said it showed that the heart had resumed beating. <laughs> nice so. writing but very morose topic so. yeah that's a pretty good description of how he writes piven asserts that disease is a crucial theme of mishima's work noting the 1948 story martyrdom in which dreams lead the protagonist to layers of various diseases suffered in childhood the diseases greet him with intimacy, and when one approaches him, he noses a foul odor. When he tries to shove the disease away, it transfers itself stickily to his hand like oil paint. Imprisonment, silence, immobility, darkness, stench, lurking disease, viscous and adhesive contamination. This is Mishima's youth. To say he was a little worried about getting really sick. The familial trauma doesn't stop there. Mishima was hardly allowed to see his mother, and his father, a government official, was the worst kind of hard-ass. Hell-bent on making his son aggressive and tough, Azusa Hiraoka subjected the young boy to various kinds of gratuitous torture and stress. Mishima's father subjected him to Spartan training, and even held his four-year-old boy perilously close to the tracks as a passing locomotive roared past cacophonously, emitting clouds of black smoke. Azusa then told Mishima that if he cried like a weakling, he'd throw him in a ditch. Just top parenting stuff. That's good Where's for CPS. Already from age three, however, Mishima had become so emotionally withdrawn and obedient that it only further frustrated his father. 
reticent to provoke reactions from his violent grandmother, who would wake Mishima up at night screaming, crying, tearing her hair, at least once holding a knife to her throat threatening to kill herself. Mishima's emotional development from early on signals tremendous traumatization. Once he was finally left to rejoin his parents at age 12, Mishima's father became a violently suppressive presence in his life. It was due to Azusa's rejection of Mishima's desire to become a writer that led him to adopt the Yukio Mishima moniker. It is this combination of factors, a sick and abusive grandmother, a constantly unwell and immobilized corporeal existence, a tyrannical and violent father, that set the stage for Mishima's bizarre approach to gender, sex, and human physicality. As Piven writes, Mishima's exposure to such deprivation, sadism, immobility, darkness, stench, and disease would lead to a personality beset by immense terror, rage, unresolved conflict regarding women, trenchant feelings of betrayal, self-loathing, and unrequited needs. Viscous disease and wicked femininity became experiential and perceptual lenses, a tactile experience of body, self, and world that was an infuriating and ceaseless plague to be despised and transcended. Mishima gained a high-level education from the age of six from his father's government position and developed an appreciation for both Japanese and European art and literature. The latter, in particular, was instrumental in developing his affinities. In Confessions of a Mask, Mishima wrote about childhood encounters with European art, though the qualities he described being drawn to should sound alarms in your head. In one passage, he describes being taken as a boy with artwork of a knight in a picture book but became horrified at what he learned. What was he horrified by? Was it the, the danger of war, perhaps? No. The picture showed a knight mounted on a white horse, holding a sword aloft. The horse, nostrils flaring, was pawing the ground with powerful forelegs. There was a beautiful coat of arms on the silver armor the knight was wearing. The knight's beautiful face peeped through the visor, and he brandished his drawn sword awesomely in the blue sky, confronting either death or, at the very least, some hurtling object full of evil power. I believed he would be killed the next instant. If I turn the page quickly, surely I can see him being killed. Surely there is some arrangement whereby, before one knows it, the pictures in a picture book can be changed into the next instant. But one day, my sick nurse happened to open the book to that page. While I was stealing a quick sideways glance at it, she said, Does little master know this picture's story? No, I don't. This looks like a man, but it's a woman. Honestly, her name was Joan of Arc. The story is that she went to war wearing a man's clothes and served her country. A woman? I felt as though I had been knocked flat. The person I had thought a he was a she. If this beautiful knight was a woman and not a man, what was there left? Even today I feel a repugnance, deep-rooted and hard to explain, toward women in male attire. This was the first revenge by reality that I had met in life, and it seemed a cruel one, particularly upon the sweet fantasies I had cherished concerning his death. From that day on, I turned my back on that picture book. I would never so much as take it in my hands again. That's so... That's really interesting. It's like the fantasy of death is like a very positive, like valiant fantasy almost until yeah. he realizes or he's told that it's a woman. And then <laughs> even if she were to die, I guess because it's a valiant fantasy, it sounds like the death is no longer justified. Well, valiant death is reserved for men. It's one of those tenets of, of masculinity. So something worthy of exhalation in a man is worthy of decrying in a woman to the point like where he recoils at, and repudiates the book itself. The level of rejection uh, it does not bode well for the future for, for this young man. So that passage is wild, but it's not as if he were a rampant misogynist already as a little boy. In fact, Mishima's early experiences with masculinity were often of deviance and incomprehension. He describes dressing once as the female magician Shokyokusai Tenkatsu and being met with a disapproving gaze from his mother that sent him to tears. This magician uh, of the time. He later describes dressing once as Queen Cleopatra from Egypt. But in his consumption of stories and art, he found himself consistently loathing female characters and adoring male characters, particularly ones who would meet grisly deaths. 
Although as a child, I'd read every fairy story I could lay my hands on. I never liked the princesses. I was fond only of the princes. I was all the fonder of princes murdered or princes fated for death. I was completely in love with any youth who was killed, but I did not yet understand why, from among Anderson's many fairy tales, only his rose elf threw deep shadows over my heart, only that beautiful youth who, while kissing the rose given him as a token by his sweetheart, was stabbed to death and decapitated by a villain with a big knife. Youth? I did not yet understand why, out of Wilde's numerous fairy tales, it was only the corpse of the young fisherman in The Fisherman and His Soul, washed up on the shore, clasping a mermaid to his breast, that captivated me. Yeah, yeah, she ain't looking too, she ain't looking too sweet right now. I guess the homoerotic tie potential there is mediated through the violence. It's, it's just confusing. It's like a contradictory emotion, you know? Yeah, you have well, no sex idea and violence, how... Sex and violence, actually, you know? Only the boys, huh? We see how this manifests as Mishima's career moves forward. He wrote his first short story at the age of 16 for the school literary magazine and went on to be tutored by writer and Japanese nationalist Hasra Zenmei. It's said that upon Hasra's deployment to the Japanese army in World War II, he told Mishima, I have entrusted the future of Japan to you, which stuck with Mishima throughout his life. Hasada went on to go berserk when Japan officially surrendered in World War II, allegedly accusing his commanding officer of being a Korean spy, killing him, and then killing himself. Huh? We're gonna have to do Olympic level censoring for this one to get monetized. Woo! This is nothing compared to what we got coming. At this time, Mishima had established himself as a prodigious new voice in the turbulent East Asian nation state that had been dominated by increasingly violent imperialist policies. His writings espoused devotion to Shinto, fascination with ancestry, and interests in gender and violence. From the late 40s through the 50s, the prodigy star had risen both at home and abroad, though not without some controversy and speculation over the unusual themes of his works. Put simply, Mishima's work is full of misogyny and violence of all kinds towards women, and interrogation of disease as well. Piven writes, there is an intrinsic psychological relation between sickness, impurity, and misogyny in Mishima, saturating and seeping into so many of his fictions that it coalesces as a relentless leitmotif. Old sinister Shunsuke of Forbidden Colors despises the vajayjay and vows revenge on loathsome women. Like, you don't like pussy? <laughs> like despises the <laughs> and Despises the that's wild sentence. It's like Adam 22 and Sneeko. Remember that clip? <laughs> it's like, but these are gross. They're all like open. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He did say that. Yeah, yeah. It's a gaping hole in a woman's body. Yeah. If I stuck the saliva in my mouth right now, which I won't, that would be like sucking a dick. Licking of a It's like a pit of mucus and flesh, fleshy tissue and babies come out of there. Periods. And he literally shoots porn. The fuck are you doing? Women's gender are evil, reeking, putrid, carnal, undulating, vomiting things, regurgitating blood-soaked corpses in childbirth. I'm sorry, I'm an abolitionist to an extent, but like, they need to lock this nigga up. Like, he ain't, there's, he, there's no way. There's so much like, like, rage being filtered, being articulated there, like, dis pure disgust. Yeah, like, um, how does he describe dis it's like be beautiful, <laughs> vain, vain, vain ridden. You could put yeah. right in your mouth. Like there's, <laughs> there's, there's just can't there's, help it. Well, I mean, he has a whole thing about swords. You will, yeah. you very will, very follic, very follic. You're going to start very to see what's going on. Loves Berserk. Young Maleficent Noboru of the sailor who fell from grace with the sea sees the vagina as a wound, a pitiable vacant hole, while woman is the sinister force that dominates men and enfeebles their glory. Didn't Andrew Tate say that? Yeah, he like verbatim called the a cut. Yeah, the Adam 22 clip, I I mean, play it if you want, but it's uh, it is describing exactly that. Just like an open wound. Yeah. It's, just, it's like bizarre because that. That's that, fascinating. That, that idea all... is carried through. Mizoguchi of the Temple of the Golden Pavilion digs his heel into the belly of a person who works in a specific realm in sadistic pleasure while his depraved friend humiliates women and commits a word that starts with R on an elderly widow during a Buddhist ritual. Just some descriptions of things going on in Mishima books. 
Why? Yeah. Piven ties this to Mishima's experience with his grandmother, opining that Mishima needed to escape her filthy and diseased nature, also resenting women for emasculating weak men. But it's also the socio-political landscape- hey, the sun's coming back. But it is also the socio-political landscape which surrounded Mishima, which further emboldened his views on women. Japan has long had a highly sexist society, much like the rest of the world, in which traditions bound to things like Confucian philosophy and political economy led to women being condemned to constant abuse and exploitation. Sometimes, as in the examples that Piven writes of, or in this passage from his 1950 book Thirst for Love, in which his narrator quips that women lie about being sick or some shit, misogyny presents a strong theme in his writing. But being that these are fiction works, this can be interpretable in many directions. And sometimes Mishima writes essays where he says misogyny is good, as he does in the essay Discourse in Misogyny, which he starts by writing, I think that misogynist, or woman hater, is a highly venerable title. Not leaving much to the imagination there. At least he's honest, you know? Bro, he came out the gates with it. Like... <laughs> Mishima was so... Woo, he was so misogynistic that ever the bashful one, he declines the title of misogynist because it's it's too good or something. Saying that rather than being a misogynist, I simply think in the old fashioned way that women are not to be taken seriously. Women are inferior. And I have rarely met a woman who is not foolish. I read this text through some sort of AI generated audiobook in which the video has been covered with comments like, I never thought this level of base was even possible, and dude would have loved 4chan, as a preview of our discussion on Mishima's legacy later in this video. That being said, Mishima's prose is beautiful, and his voracious examination of the human condition through taboo subjects like sex, gender, and disease bring him renown to this day, often even among people who don't share his views. Is this like publicly known? Like, or like, is this oh, like, yeah. and this is PewDiePie's like, this is, this is his favorite author, he said. Yes. I mean, any discourse I've seen about this guy or usually writers in general is mediated through their work and not really their politics. Like, I'm, I'm sure in the cultural context of an American enjoying the work, articles like this aren't the first thing you find on Google, you know? Yeah, to be fair, like, I mean, like, his writing sounds beautiful. I mean, like, the way that, like, he stylizes it, it's just what he, the the subject matter of what he's saying is rather morose, but, like... I don't know, the, the, this reminds me of the whole thing on Twitter where people watch a movie and don't like it because they think the uh, director is saying, this evil guy is good. I like him. This is, I'm a pro uh, evil guy and evil movie. When it's just you're misinter- you're kind of like, you're getting um, emotional about something that. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I think they passed me a number. <laughs> um, the amount is- I will unmute him. There he goes. Like you're saying, it's not with necessarily the politics, but the art isn't promoting the politics as much, as, even if it's presenting them. Yeah somewhat uncritically it's like just media literacy when it comes to art people being like this is bad and bad don't read this because it's scary but it's like goodfellas isn't pro um everything that happens in goodfellas yeah sorry about that sorry about that, that is literally okay. someone was on my ring doorbell and like they were like asking me if i if i'd be interested in a jehovah witness pamphlet it was the most aggressive jehovah witness i've ever encountered i mean i'm not even there he says he he worries for my soul I, I worry about your soul too, but for different reasons. I'm worried about it as well. I'm worried about, I'm worried, yeah, man. I'm worried about the soul of my shoes. Like, bro, like, come on now. And not only that, but like, it's also not a deal breaker for like a lot of folks, unfortunately. Right. Like this being something that we're looking at a lot more critically, oftentimes, like depending on the person reading, would not even for a second glimpse at this as something that's objectionable or anything. Like they'd right. say, okay, yeah, you know, like this is what you could potentially hear to varying degrees in a barbershop or in like a locker room of a D1 football team. Like the prose and the delivery might be a little less eloquent, but the vulgarity maybe a couple steps removed. So like for a lot of people, I, I'm actually now in retrospect, not too surprised that people would put them on his top 10 because they're speaking, he's speaking romantically and waxing poetically about a misogyny that is in a misogynist society that is mm. sometimes in many different places rather acceptable. Right. It can be seen the same way that there are certain artists like in hip hop or in rock that we Precisely. listen to. 
and like they might have terrible views and sometimes those things just come through in the music but sometimes it does slap or you're still just like yeah double consciousness i can listen to this and be like and enjoy this for what it is and also find it fascinating and also like know that it's not about what i view personally and the people that want to that don't want to listen to it for whatever various reasons that they could that like maybe those those mindsets more directly affect like you can kind of hold space for that you know like you were exactly. saying someone that won't read mishima because of the politics even i mean that's even a more extreme example because he was so explicit about it whereas a lot of other artists never are but you can understand why and what's also interesting about his thing is that much of what he expressed about himself would make him as much of a pariah within the historical far right as the women he despised In Piven's conclusion, he wonders if Mishima's hate for women was rivaled by his hate for men. I'm not really feeling that. I don't think that's true. His hate for men did exist, though, I guess. It took on a different form, though. Much like his hate for women was seemingly influenced by the throes of life with his grandmother, his hate for men could be sourced to his father's abusive parenting. But masculinity was not just a source of Mishima's interrogation. It was an obsession. Mishima was a man who both needed and despised men, even if he continues to be championed by gay readers. Despite his ostensive misogyny, Mishima was also exceptionally misandroistic. That's Piven's take. Misandry, you know, I'm not sure what to make of that, but either way, the guy didn't like anybody in some ways. Mishima, though, was almost certainly attracted to men. He also had allegedly very peculiar sexual proclivities. From the 2007 novel Mishima's Sword Travels in Search of a Samurai Legend, author Christopher Ross cites a standout anecdote about his ventures in S&M sex clubs, described thusly in a spectator feature. Ooh, this is gonna be fun. Okay. The most startling... <laughs> the most startling... <laughs> The most startling insight into Mishima's motives is revealed in an interview with an old lover in an S&M club, where the author resists an invitation to show me a move. Mishima picked up the then 20-year-old student in a gay bar. Sex took the form of role play. Mishima enjoyed acting out a seppuku complete with the appropriate props, a death poem, a sword for his lover to clutch, and, from his briefcase, a length of red cloth, the blood and guts. The young man watched amazed as Mishima got hard at once. <laughs> the young man watched amazed as Mishima got hard at once, and as he died, he without touching himself at all. I had never seen anyone do that before. That is amazing. That's beautiful. He was like, yeah, he knew what he liked. And <laughs> he knew what he liked. That tracks with the whole uh, <laughs> male violence and valiant, you know. God damn, that's perfect. I genuinely don't know if I'll ever recover from this. <laughs> like, I mean, like, I don't even think I have the spoons to even deal with that. Weeb's got to get on this. I bet Weeb's could really get some kink stuff going if they if they learned about this. It really speaks well to his own, you know, how deeply ingrained his own desires were in this, Whoa. that were reflected in his work, you know? Mishima appeared entirely uninterested in his lover. I think I was just a witness to something he wanted to do in front of an audience. After three dates of role play and no show me a moves, he dropped the author. Seppuku fetish aside, somehow that theme's coming up later, by the way. There is a significant amount of testimony to the fact that Mishima frequented gay clubs and pursued relations with men, with evidence dating back even to biographical works like Nathan's from 1974. This has not come without a fair amount of denial, particularly from his family and the fact that he had a wife. There's even a viral clip of him talking about his wife, actually. And the first reason I got married Yoko is because she's an artist's daughter. My father-in-law is a Japanese painter. And uh, she has no imagination at all as for artists. <laughs> Very important thing. <laughs> but of course, people can be bisexual, or closeted gay, or whole spectrum of things. The point is that he wasn't exactly straight as an arrow. Let's just say that. It should be obvious to say that there's nothing wrong with being gay. I'm not sure that the right-wingers who love Mishima feel this way, though. 
They seem to be reckoning with it and trying to feel this way. Sometimes in comment sections, they spin his closeted gayness as some type of based duality. Sexually attracted to men, yet simultaneously had respect for and understood the absolute importance of heterosexual relationship and marriage as the building block of society. Sexuality is a strange thing, and homosexuality by no means excludes one from being far-right and traditional in practice and in respect to understanding how a healthy society functions. This is just like when Christians are like, it's okay to like feel gay, just don't act on it. This is also, I think, a comment on that video you were talking about where he's talking about his wife. Where people were like, isn't he gay? And somebody was like, yeah, but he understood that that wasn't something you do. And that was what was cool about him. You know what I mean? He was a, like, good, he was a good gay. Like, he was the best gay. Now, the details of his pursuits are actually troubling. As Piven notes, citing from the Nathan biography, Nathan writes of Mishima's unabashed homosexuality during his stay in Rio, where he would regularly bring young boys of 17 or so, the kind who would hang around in parks. In Paris, he asked a friend to take him to a bar for pederasts. This took place throughout the 50s, when Mishima was in his 20s and 30s. So, age gaps, you know? Age gaps. It's giving Cody Ko. But more so, it's not just about problematic age gaps, potential pedophilia. It's even more exploitative to visit other countries in search for local, usually working class or poor young men as a powerful, much older person with a lot of money. That's just super predatory. Mishima's homoerotic interests were also quite famously subjects of his writing, although often colored by deeply unsettling desires and gender concepts. It's not as if he was just writing about healthy romantic relationships between two or more people of the same sex. Piven summarizes the phenomenon of Mishima's violent erotic fantasticism in this passage, which is so not safe for work that I can't even read it out loud. There's no way that this get monetized, bro. I ain't gonna lie to you. Can you even bro. describe this as... Obviously you can, but homosexuality with essentially the opposite party existing as an object of violence, an object of pleasure for him, but it's not even their, them that is access to the pleasure. It's what he can exert over them through violence. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that, that tracks with the whole uh, seppuku thing, having an audience, the person is not there in some actual relationship or a typical human relationship physically. Like it doesn't sound like he ever, you know took care of the other guy, basically, is what I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. The sex wasn't about, l like, any type of love or even lust, I feel like. I feel like it was, like, more so power. Yeah. Um, the sex was about power or maybe even reclaiming the power that he was denied. I don't like to psychoanalyze from an armchair, yeah. but, like, the power that he was denied as a kid, maybe, like, maybe he wants to be the person that he needed when he was enduring the emotional terrorism at the hand of his father or his grandmother or something like that. He wants to be the person powerful enough to take charge in these situations. So he has exacted that in some rather depraved arrangements with other men. Yeah. 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 And boys. And, and boys. I'm interested in the last sentence of this passage, particularly the same boy who adores the towering Insurrection of the sailor despises fathers, just as Mishima himself loathed his own father while imploring Japan to worship the idealized emperor. Speaking of which, perhaps the thing that Mishima is most infamous for is his devotion to the violent project of the Japanese empire. In 1945, Mishima enlisted in the military for Japan. It wasn't really his choice at that point, only to be sent home with tuberculosis. In that same year, his sister died of typhoid fever. More connections with disease, but I think this moment is also key in understanding a certain compunction that he has, a certain fascination with serving the empire and becoming powerful and strong, overcoming weakness and illness. Mishima's inability to serve in the military for the waning empire of Japan and the fall of his right-wing imperialist cadre of writers that came after Emperor Hirohito's surrender in World War II set the stage for his continued radicalization. As a young man, Mishima coldly disassociated from the romantic school of writing that had helped bring him up, and then sought out the mentorship of Yasunari Kawabata, a respected, generally apolitical writer with whom he began a not uncomplicated relationship. 
I don't know exactly what that means other than they had tensions about politics, but uh, who knows, maybe he was also a dick to him, whatever. Kazuyoshi Kawasaka's essay, Mishima Yukio and the Homoeroticization of the Emperor of Japan, analyzes the connection between Mishima's confounding sexual interests and his militant right-wing politics. In the 60s, Mishima's writing became overtly political, combating the surge and leftist sentiment at the time connected with massive protests against a US-Japan treaty agreement. Kawasaka notes Mishima's 1968 essay, The Defense of Culture, red flag of a name if I've ever seen one, as a communique of ultranationalist tropes. In one instance, Mishima writes, Japan is a rare country in the world, which is an ethnically homogenous and unilingual one, and our nation, which shares the language, culture, and tradition, has kept political unity since the dawn of time. Thus, our cultural continuity is entirely dependent on the inseparability of the people from the state. But this is just plainly bullshit, as is his claim that leftists need to claim the problems of human alienation and alienation of ethnic minorities based on a fiction. Kawasaka notes that the Empire of Japan was a highly multi-ethnic state, as is what happens when you colonize the people of Okinawa, or the Ainu people, or Koreans, or Taiwanese, or Filipinos. We're all one. We're all one big happy family, guys. Come on. Yeah. And this assertion that Japanese people have been unified politically or culturally since the dawn of time, especially including those people you just colonized who are now still considered a different ethnicity. But come on, like what kind of ahistorical shit is that? Mishima, and maybe the most fashy thing he could possibly do, fancied himself as a kind of libertarian, according to Kawasaka. Um, which is just like that was too much for foreign. He just had to log off at that point. He's <laughs> no, like, no discourse for me. He said, not the libertarian. Then, oh, actually, I forgot to also change my background. I didn't want it to be this blur thing. Okay. So, oh we're gonna start my by... God, no. <laughs> he disconnected yeah. exactly what I said he identified as a libertarian. So, yeah, the gods That's weren't happy about I... that. So, they sent, they sent the flood. Viewing the state as necessary for imposition of order and culture as the center of diversity and disorder. The emperor, in his view, should be the cultural center that unites all Japanese people. Wait, I thought he said that it was supposed to be the political. Who knows? Of course, asserting that all these different groups of people you've colonized should be united culturally within a monoethnic state, and moreover declaring communists as an enemy, and saying that them thinking that these minorities are suffering is actually plainly dumb, they don't know what they're talking about. Just like talking points that we're used to, right? Nonsense. And these suggestions, by the way, that with all this, that he's the one who cares about freedom and diversity are tenuous at best. Much of Mishima's work in the 60s delved into celebrating and stylizing ideas of devotion to the emperor, quashing revolution, and extending humanity and glory to far-right figures. His 1961 short story Patriotism, which he turned into a film in 1966, is a glorification of the coup d'etat attempted by a section of the imperial military in 1936, also known as the February 26th incident, with the aim of returning Japan to its far more conservative roots predating the Industrial Revolution, including a totalitarian emperor. Of course, both this Kodoha faction, as they called themselves, and the victorious opposition faction that they went against were both very far right and violent. The difference is that the Kodoha opposed any of the Western styles of bureaucracy and capitalism in terms of the exploitation. They wanted to go back to that good old samurai system, and the others were like, eh, bureaucracy is cool or something. It's a mess, girl. It's a mess. Anyway, that's the type of conservatism Mishima was into. Romantic conservatism, matching his romantic literary ideations once upon a time. In the film version of Patriotism, a lieutenant who has been given strict orders to commit seppuku sits broodingly under a banner that reads wholehearted sincerity in kanji, is consoled and then uh, loved up by his adoring wife, and then commences a five minute scene wherein the lieutenant takes the blade and does his thing and dies. It's very graphic. I want you to guess who stars as the lieutenant in Yukio Mishima's film, Patriotism. Who stars as the noble soldier who dies graphically for five minutes? Just guess. The idea of soldiers committing seppuku upon failing to restore Japan to its traditions, traditions that were disastrous for women, might I add, was always riveting to Mishima, riveting in particular ways. I hope this explains the bizarre 
story from earlier with the club and stuff. Mishima's earlier writings expressed a journey of disentanglement, bearing out the most gruesome fantasies and traumatic memories he could bear to share. But by the 60s, many years after his romantic stylings and increasing conservatism were out of fashion, let's say, and Japan had moved on to deeper questions about modernization, about fancy things like unions and racial equalities, Mishima had found the perfect outlet for his proclivities and interests. The longing for Japanese tradition, for empire, for noble sacrifice, for Bushido, the noble code of the samurai. I won't explain to you too much about what Bushido is, but there's a really good video that I'll link to in the description about it. If you know anything about it and about samurai and have been paying attention, it shouldn't be surprising to learn of how Mishima died. In 1968, he formed a militia called the Tatenokai, or Shield Society, through a small magazine. The militia was not the most formidable. British journalist Henry Scott Stokes who later became a Holocaust denier, that's random, but I'll throw that in there, had an audience with them and the Japanese military folks who oversaw and helped to train them, writing that, in general, they were extremely amateur, plainly lacking the experience that an English soldier would get in his first four weeks of basic training in the barracks. Their field exercises were lamentable, so much so that the good-natured GSDF men laughed at them openly. Everybody laughed. Mishima himself would very much tone down the seriousness of the occasion by his quips and light comments. Mishima, rich from his career in literature, funded the whole thing himself. Because why not? He even fashioned cute outfits for his boys. His own little club of fashy young men, devoted to two men, Mishima and the Emperor. And so his death... I'll be a little short about for specific reasons, monetization, but also thematic ones. There's plenty of stuff from even just looking at Wikipedia that will fill you in on some of the details. And John Nathan's biography has also quite a bit of description about what he went through in that last year. But on November 25th, 1970, Mishima and four cadets from the Tatenokai staged a coup against the emperor, holding a commandant hostage. Scholarship of the event, including Nathan's, suggests he had no real pretenses that such a coup was actually going to succeed. Bro didn't think he was like that at that point. He knew his forces were weak, not at all prepared to handle war, and what's more is that <laughs> Japan was not going to support this nonsense. Nobody wanted the emperor to have absolute power over this fucking country anymore, especially because they were doing pretty good after the capitalism had surged and they got a nice deal from the U.S. The coup was a stage. In a letter sent beforehand to reporters, Mishima pleaded to understand that this is a minor incident, merely a private play of our own. Mishima gave a rousing speech from a balcony, which the soldiers of the base likely did not hear much of, cried out, long live the emperor, and then did ritual seppuku. It was a mess. Let's just say his commanding officers struggled to get the job done. One of them, at the time his young right hand, chose to do the same shortly afterward, and there's some reports from one of the survivors that Mishima really did not want him to do that. So, really sad all around. But thus ended the transformation of Mishima, and to some degree the birth of a legend. As Kawasaka writes, in his early works, same-sex desire is expressed as being disturbing for the men who hold it. It is a shameful desire, or a desire isolating men from society. In his later works, however, homoerotic desire is not shameful, but rather an essential desire to participate in national politics. In his discourse, homoeroticism builds a mutually complementary relationship with Japanese national politics. Now, homoerotic desire is something essential in a nation-state. Five decades after his death, Mishima's legacy now stands as one that radically reconceptualized masculinity, that yasified the Japanese far right, and celebrated the iconography of buff men who train hard and lament a broken society in modern times with each other's adulating company. And now his is a legacy that complicates and radicalizes the Japanophilia of men online around the world today. Well, like a few of them. I don't think most people really know much about Mishima, actually. But you know who does? Six years ago, the prominent YouTuber PewDiePie put out a video declaring Yukio Mishima his favorite author. 
when I discovered Yuki Mishima, I did it by pure coincidence. I didn't know anything about him and I just fell in love with his writing and I fell in love with finding out about his ideas, but also his life. Just this, the joy of discovering him was so great that I wanted to honor that and, and keep that going with what I read from him. As part of a book club series, PewDiePie gives his thoughts on Spring Snow and Runaway Horses, two of Mishima's books from his famous Sea of Fertility tetralogy, which he published toward the end of his life. Both books take place in a period ranging from the Meiji Restoration early on into Japan's imperial period in the early 20th century. Now, if you don't know what Meiji period is, just Google it. It's hilarious because <laughs> it's the least Japanese thing you've ever seen. It's just that uh, people talk about cultural appropriation. Just Google Meiji period. They center on young men devoting their lives to doomed causes, fighting for or with ideas of traditionalism, pre-westernized Japan, the nobility of Bushido and the samurai code. Color me shocked. PewDiePie loves these themes. He loves this about them. He says so in the video. I want to note that there are plenty of people who enjoy Mishima's work and it is entirely possible to have him even as one's favorite author without sharing any of his views. PewDiePie would like you to believe that that's the case for him. And I think he thinks that. I think he thinks that that's the case. I'm not sure if that's really the case based on what he says, but I think he at least tries in that sense. What PewDiePie notes in this video from years ago in terms of what really inspires him about Mishima is his devotion to Bushido, the samurai code, and his idea of taking action based on your beliefs, even when it seems hopeless. He even expresses fascination by how Mishima lived by this in reality. Much like his character in Runaway Horses or in Patriotism from earlier, Mishima died of seppuku after attempting to restore power to the emperor in a coup d'etat, ultimately dying what he considered a noble death. It's about the willingness to sacrifice yourself for the greater good and what you believe in, and also the envy and jealousy of that glory of having something worth dying for. Yukio Mishima himself, the author, created his own uh, military, the Tatenokai. It seems like this idea of fighting for a hopeless cause, even if it ends in one's death, is very appealing to a lot of young men around the world. A good death is its own reward. Putting yourself through tremendous injury and showcasing that to the world as a testament to your devotion to a cause the rest of the world won't care to align with, either because they're too scared, too of the times, or just generally not able to transcend them. I can maybe see this as noble if said cause were something other than the restoration of the most hierarchical system possible, one where women are meant to be subjugated and men are meant to lay down their lives to protect a birthright monarch and his authoritarian code. But this is what Mishima died for. Even if slash when we're meant to gawk and laugh, to not take seriously the rampant misogyny expressed by his protagonists, such as in Spring Snow when Kiyoaki declares, every woman without exception is a liar and nothing but a plump lascivious little animal. Mishima's stories without fail devote themselves to men who love empire, hate themselves, and die in vain. And sympathetic women where they exist are described erotically in the most r slash men writing women way. High swelling breasts surmounted by nipples like the buds of a wild cherry, where the shadows gathered more thickly, hair clustered, gentle and sensitive, and as the agitation mounted in the now no longer passive body, there hung over this region a scent like the smoldering of fragrant blossoms. Mishima was a complicated guy who went through some tremendous trauma, who ultimately wanted to die in the garb of a soldier, likely out of some obsession with outmasculinating his abusive father. But he still declared himself an enemy of communists. He dismissed the suffering of Koreans and other ethnic minorities in Japan, and he only rejected the title of misogynist because it did not quite accurately enough capture how much he hated women. The problem with PewDiePie and others' fascination with Mishima isn't that they think he's fascinating. I think he's fascinating, I did a whole video about him. Or that he writes well. The problem is that they openly admire his way of life and ideals, which ultimately are based in very bad things, based in hierarchies that are very violently fomented. Is fomented the right word? 
go with it. They're based in the idea that some men are better than others because obviously they just push themselves the hardest. They don't complain. They devote themselves to order and hierarchy, to men superior to them. And this is somehow a lost art because as technology has developed, society has become soft. Naturally, this ideology comes with its own exercise regimen. Years later, in late June of 2024, PewDiePie returned to making content about his favorite author with a video called Training Like Mishima for Seven Days. This is a different PewDiePie. He's got kids. He's calmer in his speech, I think. He's buff. He's obviously a lot more jacked than he was in the previous video. And he seems a bit more reticent to encourage people to do fashy stuff, especially in his name. Here, he seems slightly more wary of the politics that Mishima brought to the table by acknowledging that the author is controversial, but he just wants to discuss the book, and that's it. So, said book is Sun and Steel, a whole-ass memoir that Mishima wrote about his philosophy, particularly when it comes to training. Not sure how we're going to separate that from the author, but we'll find out. Now, the normal YouTuber analysis of this sort of thing would be to say, Mishima bad, therefore, if you like this book and you talk about it, you're bad or stupid, the end. I want to be a bit more sophisticated about this, so I took some time to read Sun and Steel and pinpoint what I think is problematic about PewDiePie's interpretation of the book. Sun and Steel opens with Mishima reflecting on his body as part of his self, and the necessity of developing his body as one does an orchard, tending to it rather than letting the weeds run roughshod, something he sees others do. Keep that in mind. He cultivates his orchard with unceasing sunlight and implements fashioned of steel. This represents a significant difference from his childhood in which he says he was consumed by words. So as a person who also grew up feeling quite puny, uncoordinated, unable to muster energy for exercise, and yet gifted at writing and imitation, I can relate to what Mishima was talking about, about words preceding his body. He speaks of words having a corrosive nature, which is meant to get to the bottom of things, with reality being one thing, the plank of wood. But to Mishima, the plank of wood, his connection with reality, which he sees as his body, showed up behind the corrosive agent, half eaten. First comes the pillar of plain wood, then the white ants that feed on it. But for me, the white ants were there from the start, and the pillar of plain wood emerged tardily, already half eaten away. Thus, Mishima's sun and steel philosophy was created in the journey to finally undo that condition that he began his life with, to put significant emphasis on his body to overcorrect for its lagging behind his sense for words, which blossomed in their everythingness, their belief of being existence rather than emerging from a subject, a body. This is all jargony and complex, but uh, this is just my attempts to also relay Mishima's thinking in the way that he writes about it rather than summarizing it in the ways that some might and saying that he's just saying to touch grass and exercise. Mishima kind of philosophizes that in order to ground himself, so to speak, he must create great space in his life for rigor, for hard-edged discipline, summed up as taciturnity and beauty of form. Sun and Steel is, <laughs> yes, sort of a treatise on how to touch grass, which is what PewDiePie seems to like about it. Mishima thought there was too much emphasis on intellectuality in society, and I think there's something interesting about a Nobel Prize-worthy novelist coming to this thought. As an author, he felt his words were corrosive. Thoughts on their own are just that, they're abstract. While in contrast, the physical has actual grounds in reality. I think this part of Mishima's writing should be understood a bit more contextually though. Finding himself one for going against the ways of the times by his account, Mishima as a youth rebelled against the sun, opting instead for the darker corners he could lurk and write in. I loved my pit, my dusky room, the area of my desk with its piles of books. Now this is during wartime though, and as the wartime era ends, Mishima sees a change in the people around him. As he came of age post-war, he felt the dynamic had shifted. I gradually sensed that an era was approaching in which to treat the sun as an enemy would be tantamount to following the herd. This came after, you know, he, he grows up as a writer and finds other intellectual types like himself and noticed that they too seem a bit pale and out of shape. And this freaked him out. The men who indulged in nocturnal thought, it seemed to me, had without exception dry, lusterless skins and sagging stomachs. 
They sought to wrap up a whole epoch in a capacious night of ideas, and rejected in all its forms the sun that I had seen. The essence of Sun and Steel is of a man growing up and comparing himself to other men, as men tend to do. Of a man compelled with words and thoughts from a young age who gradually begins to see the value in being outside and having a strong body that impresses other human beings. The prose is flowery and wanders down fascinating theoretical and epistemological roads, but ultimately, its effects are that of a masculinity influencer telling his young online audience that sitting around and thinking a lot is not cool. That the physique is not just something that shallow people worry about, and that people should actually work out instead. Why must it be that men always seek out the depths, the abyss? Why must thought, like a plumb line, concern itself exclusively with vertical descent? Why was it not feasible for thoughts to change direction and climb vertically up, ever up, towards the surface? Why should the area of the skin, which guarantees a human being's existence in space, be most despised and left to the tender mercies of the senses? Mishima's journey saw himself wanting to build a body with tan, lustrous skin and powerful, sensitively ripping muscles, and that this would actually help his intellectual pursuits as well, as it would help him understand the physicality and surface of the world better. As I say all of this, I know that you're probably thinking, well, that doesn't sound that bad. And yeah, generally it's good to take care of your physical health. Getting stronger can be quite helpful, and it is scientifically supported that exercise and proper exposure to sunlight will help one's mental health, including stuff with overthinking and anxiety, which is stuff that PewDiePie says he struggles with in his video. I'm glad that Mishima got super buff and juicy, and that a bunch of super online dudes have been inspired by him to not just sit in a chair all day, and to work out instead, even if they make silly comments like this on Esoterica videos. I rejoiced when I found Sun and Steel. The gym is my temple, the cathedral of iron. The sweat, holy water, the various exercises, the stations of the cross. I make my living in intellectual pursuits, but I find the divine in the gym in the glorious sun. Yukio Mishima, my sensei. Well, actually, hold on a minute. It seems innocent at first for people to use these wordy descriptions like Mishima, hinting at existential profundity to justify why they like to do chin-ups in the park or something. But there's something troubling behind the surface about the purpose of such a thing. For one, Mishima's not just some down-to-earth guy, some regular everyday writer looking for the benefits of exercise. This is Yukio Mishima we're talking about. Of course the change of physique is correlated to his desire to have a sweet sweet body he could k-word. I cherished a romantic impulse towards death, yet at the same time I required a strictly classical body as its vehicle. A peculiar sense of destiny made me believe that the reason why my romantic impulse towards death remained unfulfilled in reality was the immensely simple fact that I lacked the necessary physical qualifications. A powerful, tragic frame and sculpturesque muscles were indispensable in a romantically noble death. Any confrontation between weak, flabby flesh and death seemed to me absurdly inappropriate. I lacked, in short, the muscles suitable for a dramatic death and it deeply offended my romantic pride that it should be this unsuitability that had permitted me to survive the war." These references to weak flabby flesh are constant. Mishima is not exactly charitable to those who do not meet this beauty standard, like his younger self. The steel faithfully taught me the correspondence between spirit and the body. Thus feeble emotions, it seemed to me, corresponded to flaccid muscles, sentimentality to a sagging stomach, and over-impressionability to an oversensitive white skin. From the moment I understood the weakness of my flesh, it disgusted me. He kind of reminds me of... Goebbels? Was it Goebbels that was too sick to be a soldier, so he ended up being a propagandist or something like that? He kind of reminds me of that. It's very interesting to think of the intersections of disability and feelings of maybe like ineptitude to an extent, potentially. The way right. that he's reconciling with disability as a way that he is trying to reclaim what he feels as though is disenfranchisement and crimes done to him bodily. Him right. wanting to be this puissant person and then ultimately reconciling with the fact that he cannot and therefore he ends up exacting his 
clawing back of whatever disenfranchisement that he's had by being fashy and, and being yes. um, authoritarian. There's a lot going on here. <laughs> but first, the pale skin thing, you'll notice there's a lot about the skin and the tanning of the skin. That's its own red flag. Mishima in the book takes pride of the way that the sun makes his skin tanner and that that is a reflection also of the beautification of his body to which i say if you're finding yourself getting significantly darker from being out in the sun a bunch please wear more sunscreen you are likely damaging your skin irreparably potentially causing yourself skin cancer down the line and that's not good i know that people didn't used to wear sunscreen or whatever when they were being badasses in ancient times but people in ancient times didn't worry about contracting skin cancer in old age because they didn't reach it because they were dying of things like cholera and stabbing. Now, when it comes to this dismissal of flabbiness as the mark of weak, sentimental people, we begin to enter very dangerous territory. See, I like exercise. I, I like Muay Thai. I like it because it's fun and cool. I like the discipline of having to go over techniques over and over again to make sure that you do it the right way. I also like the way that form is subjective, especially depending on your bodily proportions, which you mostly can't control, something Mishima is not exactly ready to acknowledge. For example, I'm tall and skinny. I can probably change the skinny part, though it might take a lot longer than most people would suggest. I can't change the height thing, that's just stuck there, as the Drew Gooden video you've probably seen would suggest. So I'm lucky to have more height than the average person in the United States, but that also comes with its drawbacks because taller people tend to have shorter lives because of their ability to contract disease more. And also they can struggle with athletic tasks sometimes because they can put more pressure on their lower extremities leading to injuries and in their knees, their ankles, their feet. Being skinny is also a nuanced thing. We're learning more and more in science about fat and muscle building and all that stuff. I happen to be skinny with not very much fast twitch muscle, as you may be surprised to hear. I don't burst very well. I don't run super fast or jump super high, but that means I'm a bit more predisposed to having slow twitch muscle, more stamina and endurance and mobility advantages. The point of this is not to show off how cool my body is or have a debate, but to talk about a larger point that Mishima and his contemporary analogs troublingly seem to miss, which is that your body is not necessarily something you can control very much. Early on in Sun and Steel, Mishima writes about the body as one's dwelling, which they can either choose to cultivate or not. I could either cultivate that orchard to its capacity or leave it for the weeds to run riot in. I was free to choose, but the freedom was not as obvious as it might seem. Many people indeed go so far as to refer to the orchards of their dwellings as destiny. There is a degree to which we can control our physical health, but a lot, maybe most, of the substantial things that define our bodies and the way people see our bodies are not exactly changeable. Height is a great example. You can get all kinds of surgeries as a dude now, which are um, not exactly the most developed in order to make yourself a few inches taller, but obviously that will have other ramifications. And when it comes to things like disability, disease, and phenotype, we generally can only do things to manage, mitigate, and get the best out of what we've got. The most prominent voices of, of like fitness, I think they're more apolitical. Jeff Nipper is a good example. You know, he's done, he did a video about like uh, fatness and how the ideas in the fitness community surrounding fatness are usually really misguided. I, he didn't use the word ableist, I don't think, but it was it was basically making the case that like it's treated as some obvious, easy choice to lose weight and not be fat by the fitness community. One of the videos I was watching for the video I did about Think Before You Sleep, he, he said like the solutions to losing weight or the solutions to being fat, which solutions to being fat, interesting way of putting it, right. are... Easily accessible, simple, and easy to implement, which means fat people, because losing weight is simple, easy, and effective, they must, if they are fat, be stupid, lazy, and uninformed. That's the inherent to the state of being of fatness. And I think it's tied into like this, their push against modernity or postmodernism of the subjectivity of, let's say, body positivity that freaks them out, that really pisses them off because. Here's a study on, on macros. If you cut your calories, you'll be skinny. You want to be skinny because skinny is hot. It's more attractive. That's the underlying logic. Now, I think in today's society, we take for granted the idea that people are different and that that's okay and that these differences show up physically. 
Mishima's ideology shows precisely how far-right ideals can easily co-opt gym culture as a means through which we can eradicate differences. We can be anti-diversity in that way, especially against those who we can call inadequate in a classical sense of the physique. As the relentless pressure of the steel progressively stripped my muscles of their unusualness and individuality, which were a product of degeneration, and as they gradually developed, they should, I reasoned, begin to assume a universal aspect, until finally they reached a point where they conformed to a general pattern in which individual differences ceased to exist. The universality thus attained would suffer no private corrosion, no betrayal. That was its most desirable trait in my eyes. What Mishima does here lines up with one of Umberto Eco's essential points in his essential 1995 essay, Ur Fascism, in which he defines what for him fascism means as a person who lived through it and how to identify its signals. His fifth of 14 tenets is that disagreement is a sign of diversity. Ur fascism grows up and seeks for consensus by exploiting and exacerbating the natural fear of difference. Mishima's deep comfort in reforming his physique is the way it strips his difference from the ideal male form, and the more universal he feels in this sense, the better. A quick read of that essay might demonstrate that that's not the only thing that Mishima has in common with the fascists, even if you don't agree fully with Umberto Eco's definition. Mishima also demonstrates a cult of tradition. A rejection of modernism in Sun and Steel that's the soft, weak body we develop because of modernity. Individual and social frustration. Mishima's life seems to have featured a ton of that. The common privilege of national identity. Mishima's 60s political writings were prime territory for this. And anti-pacifism, which he develops post-war. And of course, an obsession with heroism and with making the average young man into a hero, as he had to do with himself and his body through the process of Sun and Steel. And arguably, there's even more. So, congrats, Mishima. You're an ur fascist. What books like Sun and Steel do, by connoting people's physical orientations as products of good or bad choices, is create configurations of supremacy. Stronger people are more moral, have a higher value than weaker people, because they choose to be strong, and weak people choose to be weak. Strong people are demarcated by how well they fit in, by their devotion to tradition, especially having a traditional beauty. We might call this ideology body fascism. At this point, I'm gonna just direct you to a really good video someone already made about body fascism in relation to this topic. It is Mika Le Fay's new video on the subject, The Fascist Physique, Weaponizing the Body, and you should watch it. Even the guy I sent you, like a lot of the stuff in, in one of the videos I watched, despite his like claims that he's, you know, at least partially a feminist, it's the return, return to tradition. The, the West is crumbling because people think being fat is hot or they're putting people in wheelchairs in video games now. Right. And that represents some sort of flaw in reality when the objective beauty and the objective representation of aesthetic accomplishment, the evidence of your ability to individually be responsible and a functioning member in society is the body. And if the body does not display that, then you're not pulling your weight or you're not living up to the ideal, I guess the individualistic ideal of not mooching off of society or not being a welfare queen. Or I think that aspect is articulated through the drain on the healthcare system of fat people. The drain, again, I'm saying it from their words, but like I'm paying taxes so that we can subsidize, you know, whatever healthcare is subsidized, which isn't much, but it's like the healthcare system being fucked up is because there's a bunch of fat people that are being treated for being fat and, you know, they can just easily choose to not be that. So it connects into this really broad societal political argument of just hit the gym, bro. Just watch, just count your calories. The gym as an institution is especially like even if you go back into like the Greek and the Roman pantheon, especially in, in that practice and culture, it was always about this compulsory moral superiority of being a particular avatar of man and specifically man. I might get some flack for this, but this at a society, even at the Greco level, is a very misogynist, sexist society. Also, what is appropriate as a body is masculine. And it's also like this romanticization of the masculine form. 
I just watched a really good video from Jeff Nipper. He's one of the people that I think he's like a good source for a lot of like scientific sort of weightlifting ideas and, and bodybuilding ideas. I think one of the maybe relevant findings was the idea that, I mean, as is kind of already known, when women rated men's ideal physiques for someone, for a partner, it was usually on a scale of one to five, the women rated the most attractive and most desirable size and aesthetic as like kind of the center, as in like muscular, but not huge and not small. And then the men rated like the number four and number five as most desirable. Like that was the average of the two, which I think is is kind of like that fetishization of the male form from a solely male perspective and from a perspective of like power and dominance. When Mishima goes out real sad, when he never actualizes any of these hard man politics. Yeah, I'm hearing the same kind of LARPing of masculinity through aesthetics that I hear now trying to display strength, trying to like peacock the strength to other men. When you read Mishima's story and you see that he embodied much of that, it's not surprising, but it is shocking to just see how much of this theory is everywhere in a lot of different societies. And it just goes to show the strength of an institution like this when it comes to fascism and when it comes to the compulsory bodily image, especially for the men, we don't really talk about it as much. When you read about Mishima and the lengths that he went to to remedy himself because he thought he was broken and the fork in the road being one of, okay, I could have easily went into a disability activist route or disability advocation route and realize that my disability is an opportunity for innovation. My inability to do a particular thing the way that the world has said that I need to do it, I now have to find a different way to do so. No, he went a different route. He went, oh, something is wrong with me. I am structurally broken. I need to fix me. And that as a choice is a very interesting choice, but unfortunately one that a lot of folks do, myself included. Yukio Mishima is Joe Rogan for weebs. PewDiePie himself probably doesn't even have many thoughts about fascism and doesn't realize the danger Mishima's views hold. And my main criticism of him here is, you should look into that more, bro. Acknowledge it. As I've said many times, it's fine to enjoy Mishima's writing. Many people enjoy, as PewDiePie says himself, Mishima's introspectiveness about learning himself and why he thinks the way he does. But especially when it comes to his essay works that are personal, like Sun and Steel, you should look into Mishima's politics and think about whether or not the things you love about his writing and thinking might also be connected to the worst views he had, and whether or not it's possible to fully separate the two. Missing this whole connection is unsurprising for someone who has constantly, inadvertently appealed to bad people. After the Christchurch shooter yelled subscribe to PewDiePie before committing mass M-word at a mosque, you would think that the man himself would be a little bit more careful about accidentally associating with far-right politics. You would think he'd be trying a bit harder than this. Regardless, whatever you think of the guy and his intentions, we can see that PewDiePie's audience does still sometimes cross over into that far-right territory. And somebody like Mishima is not necessarily the kind of guy you want to introduce to them uncritically. Mishima is a prototype of the hard man, right alongside people like G. Gordon Liddy. A guy who grew up feeling pathetic and unmanly and spent his adult life fighting that inner voice by becoming buff and advocating for reactionary politics. Including the fascination with Nazis. We didn't even get to talk about my friend Hitler. But deep down, we know that people who are secure in themselves don't need to demean others for how they look, or declare their way of being superior, or attach their proclivities to far-right conservative politics. The fact is, the dude was sad, and he went out sad. I mentioned early on that Mishima's boyhood mentor, Hasada Zenmei, entrusted the future of Japan to him. The thing is, Hasada Zenmei was just another sad guy who attached his identity to Japanese nationalism, an ideology that barely existed for half a century as a way its new nation state could get people to care about fighting for it in devastating wars. He went out sad too, and regrettably, he took someone else's life with him. He couldn't have entrusted Japan's future to anyone if he tried. The same way people like Elon Musk and Jordan Peterson constantly talk in terms of saving civilization, 
The rhetoric is a costume for the inherent insecurity of the reactionary, that the world around them is constantly changing, is turning its back on old traditions, and is constantly better for it, leaving them behind. But even if Hasada could entrust the future of Japan to Mishima, and did so, the reality is that M Mishima fumbled it at his own 30-yard line. Today's great Japanese writers often remark on Mishima as an embarrassment. In one conversation, Kazuo Ishiguro, author of Never Let Me Go, said, The whole image of Mishima in the West hasn't helped people there form an intelligent approach to Japanese culture and Japanese people. It has helped people perhaps to remain locked in certain prejudice and very superficial, stereotypical images of what Japanese people are like. To which Nobel Prize in Literature winner Oe Kenzaburo replied, Mishima's entire life, certainly including his death by seppuku, was a kind of performance designed to present the image of an archetypal Japanese. Moreover, the image was not the kind that arises spontaneously from a Japanese mentality. It was the superficial image of a Japanese as seen from a European point of view, a fantasy. Mishima acted out that image just as it was. Frankly, if you're interested in Japanese culture or art, or live in Japan like PewDiePie does, being super into Mishima is kinda cringy. Again, it's fine to love his work if you can stomach it and do the critical analysis, but trying to imitate his lifestyle or espouse his ideas is like coming to America and trying to be a cowboy by emulating Hank Williams Jr. Beyond the weird politics, it's just going to annoy people of the country because you're chasing an old stereotype because you grew up watching cartoons that made it look cool. Bushido was seen as dated and problematic half a century ago when Mishima was running around trying to espouse it. Imagine what it is today in an age where you can go online and do literally anything else. On YouTube, I think it's funny when there's like a jazz album that has a album cover with like yeah. jazz writing. It's 5 million views every time. Yeah. And same thing with the, the video of Mishima. I feel like Japanese name, guy saying something about his wife. I'm interested. Let's check it out. Wow, he's saying this, like, you know, that meme of like house in America, boo, house in Japan. Oh, it's like yeah. this, you know, fetishization of the aesthetics. But I also think the more explicit ties to politics are things like Japan is handling racial homogeneity just fine. They don't want immigrants. And that's it's working out just fine for them, which is not true. But yeah. uh, and it's like the, a bunch of Asian people in a place. There must be no, you know, diversity there. There's that. There's the anti-feminist pushes in like the, the 4B movement. Is that what it's called? I think yeah. uh, in Korea. But in the same alignment with the, what is it called when you're single and alone? Like uh, the hikikomori thing? Hikikomori and the shut in and the moving away from traditional values to the point where the birth rates are declining. There's a lot of political fetishization there that's disconnected from kind, yeah. of, kind of like some, they'll just throw that out there like, oh, look what Japan is, look what China is doing about, uh, about the birth rate problem. This is evidence that the society is crumbling and, and the reaction to that is, um, I think it's all kind of rooted in that similar ideal. Mishima is a great writer, and I understand that many can enjoy his works without espousing his views. But the reality is that he made those works in order to espouse those views. Seeing his work increasingly as a project to save Japanese society from modernization, from progressivism and cultural diversity. And in that sense, his life's project was a failure. He died by S-word, convinced it meant he died with honor for a noble cause, died a badass. But even the way he died was a spectacular failure. Mishima knew the coup wouldn't work when he planned it. All accounts of him at the time show that he was just trying to meet a theatrical end. And even then, the theater of it didn't work anyway. He wanted to give a 30 minute rooftop speech, but he cut it short at 7 minutes because nobody could hear what he was saying. He wanted to write his name in blood after doing the first part of the seppuku with the sword to show how badass he was and how much he followed the tradition. And then of course, he started doing it and he couldn't because he was in too much pain. He was in too much pain and he couldn't handle that. His right hand man, Masakatsu Morita, failed to do the chopping part right, which would have been seen as a massive embarrassment in the shogunate times that Mishima worshipped. In that way, Mishima died as he lived, filled with bitter disappointment, pretending to be something he's not. And also seppuku. 
please subscribe to my Patreon, where you can check out conversations that I have with other great content creators, including a recent one with FD Signifier, the, the GOAT, who I talked a bunch about rap with and previewed potential ideas for new videos of his. Subscriptions to my Patreon are going to be really important for me in order to keep this channel going, so every bit that you can do would be very helpful and appreciated. You can also join the channel and become a channel member and get extra stuff like live streams that I leave up or sometimes extra messages and extra emojis that you can use in the chat or in my comment section. Thanks so much for watching and go out and touch grass too, but do so with a bit more chill, you know? To put me on blast on a regular basis, I have to live with the dissonance of fighting these institutions as someone that is abled, someone that embodies many of the institutions that I'm trying to break down. You know, I am trying to fight anti-fatness because it is the same mechanism of anti-blackness and of misogyny and all of these different things. At the same time, I feel unworthy of existing as much when I'm fat. All of that products thing to right. say with body fascism in particular, it is another tool of which a systemic oppression is levied against people that don't fit a very particular and at many times unachievable mold of what is acceptable for society. And this same read can be attributed to trans folk who I would assume would associate or, or deal with this quite a bit of bodily fascism and, and compulsory need to present in a particular way. Even after, I assume, transitioning, you still have to pass in order to gain some resources, even as trans. Even though the whole point of being trans is to defy this binary, you still enter a different binary of, okay, well, now you need to be a passing trans folk. And that's how you get TERFs, and that's how you also get, like, gender critical folks that are also trans and you get Blair Whites and you get all these weird anomalies. It's all of the same thing. And it's the same thing that afflicts me and says that I am not man right. because I do not meet a particular standard that was set by white masculinity and, and hegemonic masculinity, no matter how strong and puissant I am, which is why like I just gave up in that regard because I understand and say, okay, I need to begin to redefine my masculinity and the way that my continents and the way that I show up work. Because if I go by the metric that was set by other people, I will never reach it, no matter how buff I right. get. And I guess Mishima didn't get to that point. He more so loathed that. He hated that part of him and it ultimately drove him to the ultimate fate. If the camera angle shifted, no, it didn't. If the camera angle shifted, no, it didn't. If the camera angle shifted, no, it didn't.